Good morning. My name is Dr. Rick Jordan. I'm the Regional Dean at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine in Amarillo. Thank you for attending our inaugural sex trafficking symposium. Human trafficking, also known as trafficking in persons, is a modern day form of slavery. It's a crime under federal and international law. It is also a crime in every state in America. The Trafficking Victims Act is the first comprehensive federal law to address trafficking in persons. The law provides a three-pronged approach that includes prevention, protection, and prosecution. Under U.S. federal law, severe forms of trafficking in persons includes both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. It's clear that sex trafficking damages or destroys many young people's lives. We hope that this program will help individuals identify victims so more people can be part of the effort to rescue young women and young men from the sex trafficking trade. I want to give you a very brief background about why we were compelled to present this program. Dr. Rachel Anderson, a faculty member in our Department of Pediatrics, wanted to educate our medical students on self-trafficking and how it presents in young people. She formulated a student exercise where the student's objective was to recognize that this was a possible sex trafficking situation and to figure out a way to get the victim separated from the trafficker. Dr. Anderson will take you through her simulation in her presentation, but I was highly impacted by a very important fact Dr. Anderson mentioned. 88% of self-trafficking victims come into contact with healthcare providers at some point. Think about this for a moment. We as providers will see most victims, but at least 30% of the time, the provider does not suspect sex trafficking is the possible underlying problem. Dr. Anderson's program was so successful that I nominated her for the Texas Tech Educational Innovation Award, which she won. Seeing the success and potential of this project, I approached Dr. Anderson about the need to share the program with a broader audience. Thanks to our wonderful partnership with the Laura W. Bush Institute for Women's Health and Ms. Angela Knapp, its phenomenal senior director, we've been able to make the fight against sex trafficking a mission of ours at TTUHSC. When you hear and see the presentations, I hope it is through the eyes of a parent. I hope you think about the devastating effects this would have if your child were caught up in this unimaginably horrific nightmare. These are the faces of sex trafficking. Some are very young. You can see the misery in their eyes and their experiences are often brutal. A University of Texas study found that there are more than 300,000 sex trafficking victims in Texas. 79,000 are minors. These numbers are no doubt even greater with the border crisis. Texas ranks number two among all 50 states in terms of human trafficking rates. We're second only to California, and Houston is ranked first in the nation for its number of sex trafficking victims. But this is not just a problem in big cities like Los Angeles or Houston. Look at these headlines from the Amarillo news media. It is here in Amarillo and the Panhandle. Our young people and our children are at risk. We know we won't solve problem with this symposium? It's just a start, but all of us can be important parts of the effort to rescue victims and to fight sex trafficking. Thank you for being here today, and now I would like to introduce our MC, 
Ms. Megan Collier, who is the Communications and Marketing Manager at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Amarillo. Megan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be here on behalf of the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center and the Laura W. Bush Institute for Women's Health in Amarillo and in Abilene. We welcome you to the inaugural Human Sex Trafficking Symposium titled, They Are Not For Sale. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Now, before we begin, we're happy to present a three-minute trailer provided by our local PBS station, a sting operation on sex trafficking from the Phoenix law enforcement perspective. If interested in the full one-hour episode, you will find the link in the PowerPoint for reference later. Travis, there's one coming right at you. Most people do not understand the volume of trafficking that's going on in America, in our own backyard, People want to think that human trafficking only exists in foreign countries. The recruitment is happening online and on apps and on social media where all the kids are. You are a product and you have no other value. Coming this spring, for more than two and a half years, Frontline embedded with a special police unit. We just learned that our arrest team is in position. That tries to recover women. I was out there for um, almost four years. I hated every second of it. I hated every call. Somebody sees me like arrested like this, like the girl or the pimp or something, and then we're not out here to just give you guys a hard time. We really do want to help get you out, OK? Going undercover. Once they friend me on Facebook, then I just go into their friend list and I just hit them all up with friend requests. And online. Some of them, they, they put 24 and they're actually 15. I have never, ever met a trafficker that I felt sorry for. I mean, they're literally selling humans day in and day out and making money off of them. Female. Stopping the traffickers and the buyers. It's cost different prices. Fetishes, though, are extras. So. Without customers, there's no girls out there. Without customers, there's no pimps. From the award-winning producers of Poor Kids. They mentally trap you more, way more than physically. The inside story of a brutal crime. A drug is a usable quantity that can be used up one time. A person can be trafficked over and over and over again, and that's why it's such a problem. And the consequences. For a lot of these victims, they spend years trying to rebuild their lives and to have to rehash it all in trial. It's got to be really, really difficult. With extraordinary access on the streets and through the struggles for justice. State of Arizona. It's painstakingly long, the time between the arrest and the time that we see a suspect in trial. An additional on behalf of the state. A story of courage. What was taken from me the most is like the idea of just having like a normal relationship. In the face of the unthinkable. I want to have a future for myself and like show the people who hurt me like, you know, you hurting me just made me stronger. And now, if you would please join us for the invocation, please welcome Amarillo's mayor, Ms. Ginger Nelson. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, Thank you for this time that we can be together um, and we want to ask for your blessing and for your help as we come together to work on this issue. Um, it's a difficult issue, Lord, and we don't have the power to change it except with you. 
So we ask for you to equip us today through what we hear, through what we see, um, through the people that are here to educate us and to teach us, that these words would fall, Father, on hearts that would take the words and turn them into action. And we just pray that you would equip us and inspire us, but most importantly, that you would take from today a group of people who want to make a difference in this, and you would open the doors for them to be parts of rescue, parts of financial support, parts of educating. Um, But most importantly, we ask you and we trust you to help those that are hurting. Um, Protect the women, protect the children in our world. Um, And just convict, Father. Convict and change the situations um, of people who are oppressing others. So use this time today to intentionally make a change in Amarillo, in Texas, in our country, and in the world, Lord. And we we trust you to do that work. And I pray a blessing over those who are here today to, to learn and to be used by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Tracy, and I am the director of No Boundaries International here in Amarillo, Texas. And we are so excited that you're here today. Really quickly, before you get started, I want to share a couple of things with you. One of the things that I want to do is, is dispel one of the greatest myths that we deal with all the time, and that is how does trafficking happen? And so, so many people tell us, oh, well, it's through abduction. And of course that happens. You know, that there are those situations where a van pulls up and, and throws a child in and drives away, of course. But I'm going to tell you more times than not, it's somebody that that victim knows, somebody they've encountered. It may be a family member, it could be parents, it could be a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or it could even be somebody that they met online. Because today in the world of social media, there's so many opportunities for predators to find those vulnerable people. You know, and human trafficking is something that crosses every border. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background is or your socioeconomic status is. It can impact anybody at any time. And so we want through today, we want to equip you to know how to identify those victims and understand what it really and truly looks like. You know, as we do outreach and different things like that, um, we are uh, reaching out to those that are being prostituted online. And it doesn't matter what day of the week that we look, we can find over 100 ads to purchase sex just here in Amarillo. And so, and it's not just that, it's not just happening in Amarillo, it's anywhere we go, you know, because as we go to other places and to present or to, to train some, some group of um, social workers or medical professionals, whatever it is, we look up ads to see, to get a heartbeat for what's happening in that city. And of course, we understand that not all of those are being trafficked, but for us, we also recognize that we have not met a victim yet that wasn't trafficked at some point. And so we have to be aware of what's going on because they're not going to self-identify. They're not going to understand that they are under the control, especially if it's, if it's a pimp and they've been doing this for a long time, they don't understand what's really happening to them. They believe that it's still their choice because that's what they've been told all of these years or however long they've been in the life. And so we want you to understand that. We want you to be aware of different apps and things that are happening where they're looking for for those vulnerable people. We want you to, to know that as you work with victims or you think that you've got a victim sitting in front of you, We want you to to be able to ask them questions to figure out if they are in danger. Maybe they're being trafficked or maybe they're just in danger of being trafficked because they're being groomed and somebody is going after them. You know, in the eight years we've been doing this, we have talked to hundreds and hundreds of victims. You know, our youngest victim was three years old and our oldest was 72. And so we want you to see that it happens over all ages. And again, it doesn't matter if you're, if it's, it's not just women that it's happening to, it's not just young girls, it's boys, it's adult men, it's anybody. 
And so the greatest thing that you can do is to provide hope and not be afraid to ask those hard questions, to seek help. And we want you to know that there is help available for you. There, there are resources available specific to those that are in the medical field. And so we hope that you enjoy today and that it is a great um, opportunity for you to, to be able to learn and to ask questions and to just get those resources. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Next up, I want to turn our attention to Ariel Rodriguez. He's an investigator in the Special Investigations Unit of the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission that's out of Lubbock. We're so thankful to have his expertise as part of our symposium today. Thank you, Megan. The Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission is committed to combating human trafficking in our licensed establishments. TABC is on the front line of dismantling human trafficking organizations with connections to the alcoholic beverage industry. We also know that human trafficking does not stop here. The Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission's authority gives its agents unparalleled ability to uncover criminal enterprises that uses our bars, clubs, restaurants, and other businesses to hide their illegal activity. To gain a better understanding of TABC's role in combating human trafficking, I would like to share a video with you. Each of us can help fight human trafficking in Texas. Do your part to help the victims who are being exploited in our state. My name is Allison Franklin and I am a human trafficking survivor. I cycled in and out of our criminal justice system. Making that connection that I was a victim of trafficking makes me angry, but it also gives me hope that we have an opportunity to stand up, that we all have room in this fight. We've had a number of cases that maybe have started here in San Antonio and have ended up uh, with victims in Amarillo. $200 for sex and said pick her up at her house. She will leave before two. Having those long arms to reach out to different parts of the state, it's huge. Having agents all over the state being able to leverage those resources makes cases much more effective as an agency. At the end of the day, our goal is to rescue as many victims as possible and to combat as much human trafficking as we can within the state. TABC has developed and organized a unit called the Special Investigations Unit that its specialty is in focusing on human trafficking and organized crime cases that are occurring in licensed premise and alcohol beverage industry. Because we issue the permits to the licensed premise, we can go in and conduct inspections on a regular basis. And this gives us the opportunity to uncover signs of criminal activities, especially when it comes to human trafficking. This is a program that, that we've developed in order to build the capabilities and skill sets of our agents. It's imperative that this training be at the leading edge of all training, the newest, latest innovations in technology, the newest, latest innovations in the training for our agents to ensure their safety, the safety of the public, and the safety of the potential people who could be victims of human trafficking. I wish I didn't have the story to tell. I wish I had a different story to tell. But I hope that my story, you know, inspires others to make sure this doesn't happen to someone else. The lady in the video is not an actor. Allison is a survivor of human trafficking, and she's teamed up with TABC and other law enforcement agencies and is a director of her own NGO. 
Her organization helps other victims get out of the human trafficking life. What is human trafficking? First, we need to identify the trafficker. Human traffickers use force, fraud, and coercion to lure victims and force them into labor or commercial sexual exploitation. Traffickers look for people who are susceptible to various reasons, including psychological or emotional vulnerability, economical hardships, lack of a social safety net, natural disasters, or political instability. The TABC Beverage Commission has teamed up with other anti-trafficking experts. Our team helps victims of human trafficking by actively looking and rescuing them from their traffickers. And then we pursue the traffickers. In 2019, the Texas legislator made preventing human trafficking a TABC priority. Our agency is uniquely positioned in fighting these crimes and have become a valuable investigational partner to combat human trafficking to many and local state, federal, law enforcement partners, and to our non-government organizations. TABC regularly partners with law enforcement and other agencies to conduct human trafficking operations and investigations. Our multidiscipline, multi-jurisdictional team maintains an active working relationship in West Texas and the Panhandle area. We keep each other's phone numbers on speed dial and we call each other often, as should you. If you are a member of a law enforcement organization or a government agency and you would like to work with TABC in combating human trafficking, please call our headquarters in Austin on the number on the slide. If you're not with law enforcement and still wanna help, you can. With the help of our partners in the professional field, our team has responded to numerous calls to help human trafficking victims. Once we arrive on scene, we conduct an assessment and coordinate with each other for the best plan for the survivor. The safety and health of the survivor takes precedence. After shutting down a human trafficking operation, victims need support. TABC partners with non-government organizations to help these victims of these crimes. If you want to partner with TABC to improve the lives of human trafficking victims, please call the number on the slide. Our team has direct communications with the SANE, Trauma Advocate, Child Advocacy Centers, Department of Family Protective Services, and NGOs. We would like to include you as a member of this team. If you wish to contact me directly, please feel free to save my contact information on the screen, even if it's not alcohol related. We are all on the team. We cannot help victims of human trafficking alone. It is only through your eyes and ears that we're able to help. Thank you, Megan, for this time, and thank you, everyone, for your hard work and dedication. We may not change the world for everyone, but we can change the world for one person. Thank you. Such important information, Investigator Rodriguez. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Next on our program, Dr. Teresa Baker, who received her medical degree at UT Southwestern, followed by her residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at Parkland Health and Hospital System in Dallas. She has a combined private and academic OBGYN practice in Texas Tech Physicians at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Amarillo, where she also serves as the regional chair of the OBGYN department. She's interested in teen pregnancy, postpartum depression, and promoting preventative medicine for women of the Texas Panhandle, as well as resident and student education. In addition to her roles in academic medicine and patient care, Dr. Baker is the co-director of the Infant Risk Center and holds the Rush Endowed Chair for Women's Health and Oncology. Good morning, um, I'm Dr. Teresa Baker. Um, I am here to present to you about human sex trafficking, and I'm uh, happy to be asked to do this. I'm the professor and a regional chair of the Department of OBGYN in Amarillo, Texas. And this um, presentation is about that they are not for sale and restoring their broken dignity. I have no disclosures and no conflicts of interest. And these are our objectives today. So our first objective is to describe reproductive and sexual health concerns of human trafficking, to provide a clear patient-centered approach, to discuss measures to keep oneself and the patient safe, to discuss the importance of the use of professional inter interpreters, to provide samples of appropriate language to assist with the identification of human trafficking, 
to describe the importance of appropriate documentation, to discuss the importance of organizational protocols, and to discuss the implications of law enforcement. So um, this is just about the scope of the issue and probably why I was invited to speak to you today. And that's where, where do healthcare professionals often interface with human trafficking? I am, um, as an OBGYN, probably have seen human trafficking more than I even recognize. And what the national statistics say is that the emergency department and urgent care um, departments are where most of the uh, trafficked individuals will seek um, uh, health care. And unfortunately, 63% of U.S. sex traffic survivors report that they visited the, the emergency room or the urgent care, but only 4.8% of emergency room physicians report any confidence in the ability to recognize trafficking. So that's the importance of today's talk is just to how, how you might pick up on trafficking and um, what, we, what we might be able to do in that, in that visit when we do interface with a human that we think is being trafficked to help them get out of their situation. There is a lot of um, uh, outpatient gynecologic office visits because of multiple um, sexually transmitted um, infections, unplanned pregnancies, genital trauma, and obviously um, visits to family planning clinics for um, terminations or again for STIs or contraception. So it needs to be on our radar that this is uh, very prevalent in our society. And if we're not looking for it, we're not gonna find it. And we just have to be um, on our toes when these patients um, enter our um, healthcare settings so that we um, don't miss a, miss a chance to help someone. So sex trafficking is defined as any commercial sex work, work that is under force, fraud, or coercion. And by definition, anyone less than 18 years old who's involved with commercial sex trade is being trafficked. The scary parts of this um, are that the average age of entry into trafficking is 12 to 14 years old. And I'll give you an example of um, how um, that might happen. I think we all have to be aware of this in our own homes and in our own communities. Social media is certainly a big area that, that the, uh, traffickers bait young people into um, situations where they can uh, coerce them. Uh, it happens to both female and male patients and pornography is a huge area that they um, tend to recruit. So I listened to a um, testimony of a young man who um, was caught in the pornography trade and he said it began on social media and it was just someone asking simple things like just send me a picture of you and I'll send you a um, a camera for your for your computer and that progressed to him being one of the um, most uh, uh, trafficked humans um, and he in fact um, he testified in front of the Senate committee um, about how prevalent it is and how we can fight it and the biggest um, message I can tell you um, I'm a mother I'm you know I'm work in the field is we've got to be talking about it and we've got to be talking about how how people can stay safe so that means things like you know young 12 year old girls should not have access to a computer in a closed room because they sometimes don't even realize they're in a bad situation and now we know that a lot of the gaming consoles or the gaming platforms there's ways that um, people traffickers can can access uh, young people and, and begin the recruitment process. So we need to be talking to our patients, to our family members, to our friends about safety measures to keep um, traffickers away from our young, our young people. And, and we've got to also, one of the best things that I've been told in, in all the trainings I've done is give them the ability to tell us. So for instance, um, you might say to your 13 year old, you know, if I were on the computer and I accidentally got onto a site or I accidentally made a mistake and, um, you know, I realized later that, that I shouldn't have sent that picture or I shouldn't have um, done that. 
they have to be able to be honest with you so that you can, um, you can intervene before things get out of control. What you often hear when you talk to these people is that they, they got in over their head and then they were scared to tell because they knew they would get in trouble and then it just began to escalate and escalate until they were um, being asked to do things uh, for money or under coercion, uh, you know, threats of, of disclosing uh, pictures and things like that. So please, please, please um, be having these conversations and be open to people, to young people telling you when they're in trouble. My father used to tell me, you know, if I were at a party or something and I, I knew something was wrong, that I could always blame him and use him as the excuse. We need to allow our, um, the people that we love, our patients, our, our, our um, daughters, our sons, to be able to tell us when they've made a mistake, especially um, in, a, in a way that um, we can intervene before things get out of control. So the unfortunate um, downside and when many OBGYNs get involved is the reproductive and sexual health outcomes that happen from sex, sex trafficking. And there, you know, um, often sex traffickers, um, it's, it's by force and um, they're rape situations and that causes a lot of scar tissue and um, sexual dysfunction later in life. If, um, if a young woman comes into the ER and has lacerations in her vagina from having sex, even if she tells me it was consensual sex, I'm going to continue to try to probe that because there's not a lot of um, consensual sexual acts that are going to lacerate a young woman's vagina. So you have to be um, aware that when these things, when genital trauma happens, those people are certainly at risk of being um, in a, a situation where they are being trafficked or being recruited to be trafficked. Those women who come, or those men who come in, they've had multiple sexually transmitted infections. Unfortunately, the, the downstream ramifications of that are that she's at increased risk of having pelvic inflammatory disease later, which means the infection went up into the, the upper part of her genital tract and has infected her tubes and her ovaries, and that can leave scarring and lead to infertility or increased risk of ectopic pregnancies, which is a pregnancy outside of the uterus and a life-threatening situation. Anytime that there is um, uh, blood exposure, there's increased risk of HIV transmission. So um, that's the problem with anal sex. Oftentimes anal penetration causes um, micro, uh, micro tears and there's blood exchange. And um, anytime that there's um, an a uh, laceration and, and blood is involved, there's increased risk of HIV transmission. If you're reporting a sexual assault, if someone's reporting a sexual assault to you, I, um, I, be I beg of you to think about prophylacting them for STIs. So what that would mean, <clears throat> and also for emergency contraception. So when I see someone in the ER who's telling me that they were either assaulted or um, in a, in a <coughs> coercive uh, relationship, I'm not going to wait for the results of the labs that I'm going to draw. I'm going to culture for things like gonorrhea and chlamydia and, and test for HIV and syphilis, but I'm also going to go ahead and offer prophylaxis for those um, infections because um, there's, you'll have a better success if you prophylax against HIV and any risk of transmission than, than if we try to, try to catch up after the transmission has occurred. An emergency contraception is always an option, especially when there was unplanned um, a sexual um, event. It is more effective within 72 hours, but the earlier the better. And um, so it's, it's certainly worth a discussion so that she does not have to deal with an unplanned pregnancy in addition to the trauma. Unintended pregnancies have lots of ramifications, obviously. But um, some of the ones that we deal with, um, so there are many ways that um, people can deal with an unintended pregnancy, but if, if she chooses to have an instrumental abortion, meaning she goes to the OR and someone scrapes um, or suctions the um, fetus out of her uterus, every time someone instruments the inside of the uterus, there's, in, there's increased risk of scarring within the uterus, and that's something called Asherman syndrome, and that can lead to infertility down the road as well. 
And late term abortions obviously are more risky than early term abortions. So if she's had to undergo multiple late term abortions, her chance of having um, scarring and difficulty having a normal pregnancy later in life um, is, is certainly diminished. Maternal and neonatal outcomes of unintended pregnancies, I don't think I have to tell anyone, are at increased risk of um, tobacco and polysubstance abuse, increased risk of psychiatric issues, depression, anxiety, um, uh, it, things that you know um, put, put uh, pregnancies at risk are um, increased uh, social strengths, increased financial constraints. There's just poor maternal and neonatal outcomes all the way around when a, a pregnancy is unintended and especially when it's the result of an abusive relationship. That's a time that the OBGYNs really need to be um, on their A game trying to help her get through the pregnancy um, herself as a, a healthy individual, but also trying to do the best we can for the fetus um, as well. So when we deal with um, issues that we believe are, are trafficking situations, we need to have a real patient-centered approach. And what that means is that we're thinking of her first. We're putting her safety at the top of our list that we're gonna establish trust and, and we're gonna be transparent with her about what's gonna happen. You have to understand that these women are in such a, a state of shame most of the time, and it's not only women, I'm sorry I use that um, term, but men and women that are in traffic situation, there's a lot of shame and a lot of secrecy and um, they're afraid to tell. So what our job is as the healthcare provider is to be as, as um, supportive and empowering as we can and what that means is we're gonna let her make the decisions and sometimes that can be really frustrating because she may he or she may not be ready to leave the traffic situation they may they may tell you that they're in a bad situation but be afraid that to leave that situation what they need from us is to continue to be in their corner fighting for them and give them options every time they come to the hospital, every time they encounter care. We've gotta to continue to give them options and continue to support them. And what we have to remember is that she or he has already lived through whatever trauma they've already lived through. And the fear of the unknown is much greater than anything they've survived so far. So for them to, to step out of what they've known and, and um, risk um, outing the, the traffickers or, or um, getting into a different um, situation is so frightening sometimes that they go back to the trauma that they know because they know they've survived it thus far and they can continue to survive it. And there's lots of other reasons that, that she or he may not be willing to leave the situation, including financial. Um, sometimes they, they um, coerce them by controlling all the money or by controlling the, the children or the living situation or their immigration status. So what they don't need to hear from their healthcare provider is we, don't, we shouldn't add to that shame. We shouldn't put demands on our relationship with them. So it would be a mistake for a provider to say, I'm not gonna be able to see you anymore unless you get yourself out of this situation or to put any additional shame or um, uh, constraints on your relationship with that patient. So just remember to continue to empower and to continue to support and to continue to give, her, give the options of how that person might get out of that situation. So when you're um, involved in one of these situations, it's often a very frightening uh, experience for both you and your staff and the patient, most of all. So you have to trust your intuition. You have to be alert and looking for things that um, might put you um, uh, more, more um, making you think this could be a potential risky situation, a potential traffic situation. And then you have to find a safe way to get to the patient privately. So I've seen lots of examples of this. One very common way is to send the woman to the ladies room 
the bathroom and inside the bathroom is where the information about how to ex escape trafficking is and also there might be ways that she could alert the staff like in our bathroom there's a, um, a red pen and if she writes on her urine, it's, if she writes her um, initials, there's a little sign that says, if you write your initials in this red pen on your urine sample, you are going to indicate to us that you are in a violent or a threatening situation and we're going to try to help you. And you need to build things like that into your clinic because one of the most dangerous things for her is to try to leave the situation um, and try to get out. So you have to find a way that she, he or she could, be, could um, be alone to tell you what's going on or to inform you that they need help. Remember that this is a very, very vulnerable population. So one of the things you do not want to do is hand her a pamphlet with, you know, a hotline for human trafficking that, that he, he or she could find in their purse or on them. Um, we've heard from many people that that's a very dangerous thing if, if the trafficker finds um, information on the, on the um, person that they are, um, that they've received education about trafficking or hotlines or ways to get out that that might um, trigger more violence for the, the patient. So we certainly don't want to add to the violence in her situation. So you have to build into your clinics or into your ERs ways that you can um, get to the patient or that she, he or she could indicate to you safely that they need help. If you do know that there's an, a situation or you have an intuition that there's a situation, you need to figure out ways in advance to keep yourself and your staff and the patient safe. So first of all, you know, you should, if you have any indication, you need to alert security so that they can be close. Secondly, um, never be in the room alone. That's a, you know, that's just a, very seldom are we ever in a room alone um, with a, a potential trafficker and um, the patient um, and also you always position yourself towards the door so that if you feel threatened you can you can get out and alert help oftentimes people will develop code words with their um, staff in the ER you know um, it could be something as simple as oh you know something silly like I don't see any rainbows out today or something that everybody knows that if, if they heard the word rainbow, they need to alert security. They need to uh, not leave that patient alone. They need to, you know, uh, gather the troops and make sure that nobody is at risk and have, you have to have these standardized protocols in place before you come into one of these trafficking concerns because the last thing you want to be doing is making it up when she's there, he or she is there in front of you and you're trying to figure out, you know, what you should do or who you should call. That's not the time. You need to do it now. Professional interpreters are absolutely key. You do not want to use a friend or a child or a, somebody that came with them to discuss issues like this. I mean, it, it just goes without saying that if the trafficker is the one that's interpreting, you know, they may not be telling the patient what you want them to say. They sure they definitely might not be telling you what the patient is saying. And this, unfortunately, um, in our area has gotten much more complicated because you know, if it were just Spanish or, or a, a real common language, we often have um, translators that are available. But sometimes when it's the very um, nuanced, you know, uh, languages out of different countries, it's very hard to find someone that can, can translate for you. But I encourage you to use the translator phone or services that, that you can uh, that just make sure there's a professional interpreter helping you communicate because this is often, um, these immigration situations often lead themselves to trafficking and we need to be sure that she's got, he or she has the opportunity to communicate with us that they're in trouble. When you do communicate with a um, potential trafficked human, you want to use appropriate language. And here are just some examples. And I told you earlier, it's very shameful for them. It's very um, isolating. So you need to continue to use things like, I'm here, you're, I'm here to help protect you, you have rights, you're not alone, you're not to blame. Many, many, many times when you um, hear these stories, they feel like they they, um, you know, began the relationship thinking it was the, like, you know, it was 
a, a romantic relationship and then all, all of a sudden she realizes she's being trafficked and so she feels like um, you know it's her fault it, you have to continue to hammer into them that it is not their fault it, they're not to blame and that we can help them find a way out words to be careful of using are things like coercion and sex worker and victim and call girl and these sorts of things and the reason is first of all she may not even understand the word coercion you know you want to keep your language very simple and you certainly don't want to further alienate them so you don't want um, to call them names that might be derogatory um, like sex worker or call girl or pimp or something like that you it, just use words that um would be empowering like um uh that you know that would gain trust so um again i would i would use words like we can help you you are not the you are not um you don't have to stay in this relationship this isn't your fault um you know things like that are, are much more helpful Sometimes when, when the person is using uh, terms like this, you can use them in addition to, to be able to communicate um, in terms that they understand, but just be thoughtful about the words that you're using. And you, don't, you certainly don't want to further victimize or further alienate anyone. All right, when you do um, encounter a situation, you have to document, and you have to document in a very certain way. The state only medically relevant facts and when she tells you something put quotation marks around it and write exactly what she said because when the courts use these documents that's what they're going to look to is exactly what she said so you don't want to paraphrase just use her words in the history and physical exam only the relevant exam so remember that this person has been brutalized and traumatized throughout their life and you certainly don't want to make it worse by doing a, an exam that you didn't need to do and if she doesn't consent to the exam fine then don't do the exam you know she's been she or he has not been in charge of their own body for a long time so we don't need to add to that by forcing the, an exam do document all findings cigarette burns tattoos bruises scars document in a mental health exam oftentimes this is very hard because mental health issues go hand in hand and uh, substance abuse issues go hand in hand with trafficking and sometimes it's very difficult to get these histories but you just want to be as as clear and as and precise as you can Photographs are helpful, but you've got to be careful. You always obtain consent. The first photo should have her, the patient's face and the area involved. If there's any way that you can show um, like a ruler or some scale, especially like um, bruises or lacerations, if you can get some um, way to, so somebody could understand how big that was or how small that was. And you want to include a sheet of paper with the date because the last thing you want to do is somebody to come back and say, well, that, was, that, was, you know, that wasn't taken on the day that she came into the ER. That was another day. So um, be very careful about how you document photographs. Assessment and plan. Explain the plan and the findings um, for medically treatable things. And then put that it is either not possibly or likely consistent with the history that he or she told you and include in your assessment and plan sus suspected of human trafficking and information um, you know, transferred to the patient about hotlines or uh, things like that. The chain of custody is, is complicated, but what I want you to understand, and I'll let you read this at your, um, time is if you've never done a sexual assault um, exam you need to be thoughtful because you could really goof up any chance we had to prosecute that human so when when you collect evidence in a sexual assault um, exam it has to stay with um, a person it has to be labeled appropriately it has to be transferred to the forensics labs appropriately or else it is thrown out and um, we lose the ability to prosecute and potentially stop some trafficking the implications of uh, law enforcement is and this is tricky 
sometimes when you bring up that you need to call the police or they, you'd like to get the law enforcement involved, it makes the person very um, anxious and they really start to back away because oftentimes they've had very negative interactions with law enforcement. You know, um, either break, you know, they're, um, they've either been caught or they've been thrown in jail or the trafficker has been in a situation with law enforcement or the threat of, of um, let's say, um, deportation. You know, those things really, um, you've got to be very thoughtful about when you introduce that because, uh, again, you're wanting to build trust and anything that pulls away from that trust, you've got to be very cognizant of and you don't want to lose her confidence in you. Oftentimes you can get to um, law enforcement later in the relationship, but maybe not right up front. It may really um, uh, scare them away. Okay, again, uh, this is, um, I'm going to get back to this because now is the time for all of us in all of our um, respective organizations to think about this because I guarantee you we probably all interface with people that have been trafficked or are being trafficked much more often than we, than we know. So what we need to do is build a situation in our places of work where someone could get help if they're ready. And again, you wanna be very careful about um, where you post signage. Oftentimes it's um, in bathrooms or places that only the trafficked individual might be. Um, and oftentimes you want to put uh, phone numbers that they can just memorize. Uh, one of them is 1-800-799-SAFE. Uh, um, and then this is the national hotline number. The unfortunate part of, of local resources is that it's subject to change. And so we need to revisit our organizational protocols on a pretty regular basis because oftentimes the resources within our communities change. But these national hotlines can help that individual find resources in their local community that might help them escape the um, situation they're in in a safe way. And again, you wanna think about the situations before they happen. So um, as an example, in my clinic, um, we've done this multiple times, if she indicates to us that she is in a traffic situation and ready to escape, we automatically alert um, the, the security and we have a game plan about how um, we're going to take her back out the back stairs and to um, a sec secure, safe environment. And the front desk knows not to alert the trafficker. The nurses know not to alert the trafficker. It's just business as usual until we get the, the patient or the trafficked individual to a safe environment. And then security um, comes and escorts the potential trafficker um, into um, a situation where we could um, potentially intervene there as well. But you don't want to make that up on the day that it happens. You don't want to make that up when you're sitting in a room with a patient that uh, has her first outcry. You want to know that right now. So um, the other um, big sources of help in communities are the SANE nurses. That's the sexual assault um, uh, nurse examiners and most ERs have trained SANE nurses in them. These people are absolutely invaluable and the reason is because they have they have done sexual assault exams many times and they know chain of command and they know how to, to document appropriately. So reach out to those resources right now, know how to contact them, know where um, you know how you're gonna um, interface with them when the crisis occurs. Some places use trafficking screening tools. It's okay, um, but they're often nuanced. And the, the language, um, you need to be sure that the language is something that the patient can understand and in the appropriate, um, you know, if it's in Spanish and English and whatever the case may be. And, and just again, uh, before I leave, I just want you to think about um, be cognizant that it's more common that you th than you think. And we're do when you're dealing with somebody that's, you know, maybe polysubstance abuse, using a lot of um, drugs and alcohol, maybe has a lot of psychiatric issues, that there could be um, a situation there that's being um, exploited and we need to give those people a chance to tell us and a chance to escape these difficult situations that they're in. And so I'll close with that and I appreciate your time. 
Dr. Rachel May Anderson is an assistant professor of pediatrics at T2HSC in Amarillo. Dr. Anderson received Dr. Steven Burke's Educational Innovation Award with her medical student simulation exercise of sex trafficking. She implemented the exercise at Sim Central at T2HSC in Amarillo, thus reaching students from the Health Sciences Center, West Texas A&M University, and Amarillo College. Her program provides an innovative OSCE type format regarding sex trafficking for educational exercises to better equip the students for identifying victims and helping provide them with appropriate care. Good morning, um, I'm Dr. Rachel Anderson um, and I am a general pediatrician with Texas Tech Pediatrics with a special interest in child abuse pediatrics. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about why I am doing this presentation. Um, what, when, in 2018, we started the Foster Care Center of Excellence in Amarillo. Um, and in doing so, I needed to learn a lot more about the foster care system, a lot more about trauma-informed care. Um, and so I went to um, a conference put on by the American Academy of Pediatrics for trauma-informed care. Um, at this conference is when I first heard Dr. Greenbaum speak. Um, she gave us a lecture about human trafficking that really blew me away. <clears throat> it was kind of eye-opening to see the lack of education and the lack of even knowledge about what was going on um, in the world of human trafficking. I would think about my medical training and just realize that I hadn't even like that hadn't even been addressed that hadn't been something that had been brought up i didn't remember a lecture on it um i didn't even really realize that that was in the realm of possibility um, in my medical education um, so i had a couple of really enterprising fourth years and i and we started doing um, an exercise called an oski and so what this does is a, it's a simulation um, and if you're involved in medical education at all, you know that simulations are a great way to learn. We put students, medical students, nursing students um, into these situations, into stressful situations, into all sorts of different things um, so that they can encounter these before they actually have to be with a real live patient. Um, and so we decided, why don't we do a human trafficking OSCE? Um, and so what we did, we had trained a bunch of standardized patients, so they're actors, and they come in. There is a trafficker and a traffic survivor, um, and the doctor goes in not knowing anything. So they don't know that they're going to encounter this. They just think that they're going to see a teenager in the clinic. And then when they go in, they realize that the person that is with their patient is a little bit aggressive there's things that are a little bit off in the story um, and their goal is to separate the trafficker and the traffic victim and to see if they can either get an outcry or build rapport um, things like that so it is a really nice um, simulation just so that they have this uncomfortable situation before they actually have to go into this um, after we, we do this in uh, the third year medical students who are in pediatrics, so we're doing it every couple of months and running new students through it. After they go through it, I give a lecture about human trafficking um, and talk about the points that I'm gonna talk about in this presentation today. Um, so I, you can read my educational objectives. We'll kind of go through the limitations of data on trafficking. Um, we'll talk about clinical settings in which trafficking occurs. Um, we'll talk about the common indicators and injuries and really talk about mandated reporter obligations. It's interesting to see how students respond in these situations, things they forget. They forget about doing the confidentiality statement. They forget, you know, that they do have to report these things. And so actually going through and talking about resources they have, um, I think is very valuable. Um, so medical studies back me up on this, that we are just really unprepared to identify trafficking victims, to get them the help that they need. There was um, a study for the National Institute of Justice and it talked about how our trafficking numbers are so low. We, so in one jurisdiction, we may know as little as 14% and as mo at most 18% of the potential total trafficking victims. 
We have issues in the medical field identifying victims that come in contact. So what I want to do is I'm going to give this presentation and then at the end we're going to go through a simulation um, so that you may be better prepared um, to identify these victims. So what are the clinical settings in which you may encounter the trafficking victims? So really, anybody listening to this presentation, you are in the perfect position to identify these victims. So my goal is to equip you with the knowledge and the tools that you need to assist these victims in the clinical setting. So there's a large range of healthcare personnel that may come in contact with these victims. Um, I really wanted to emphasize, of course, primary care providers, um, emergency room providers, front desk staff, nursing, therapists, things like that. Um, even security guards, so if a security guard is recognizing that the same person is bringing in multiple different patients or the billing is noticing that, hey, this person pays for multiple different patients. What is going on here? So the, it, there can be, if you know that there could be something going on, you're more likely to say something. Um, so also students, students kind of think that they fall into the background and they're just there to learn. Um, but if you keep your ears, your eyes open, you may find some of these patients. So and like I talked about, anyone in that healthcare setting may be in the position to recognize human trafficking. It does mean taking off our blinders and spending the time when something feels off. Um, so in a study of 98 survivors, 88% had one encounter with a healthcare provider while being trafficked. 63% were in the emergency room. So when we're thinking about that, um, and you're thinking about a person being trafficked, there's a lot of different situations that these people may be in. Um, one thing though is that they may be very isolated and they may not intersect in society in any other way except with the healthcare field. They may not intersect with anybody but you um, in society. And so you may be the only person that can actually render aid to these patients. So challenges when facing a potential victim. One thing I really want to talk about and reiterate is that your main job is to keep yourself safe and to keep your staff safe. Um, these are patients that may be involved in criminal enterprises. There may be, you know, drug use. There may be, you know, things that um, can really put you in a serious situation. These patient, these um, traffickers do not want to be found out and they will go to lengths for that to happen. So we really do need to maintain that professionalism. Do not give out your personal contact details, things like that. Um, you may have a lack of information about the past history of the patient. They may not know, they may be disoriented, they may be fearful. There may be coercion attempts in the room. Um, so a lot of times with a traffic victim, they they will come with their, uh, their trafficker or a person that is um, designed to watch them um, in this and make sure that they're not saying anything, or they may just be there and they may not self-identify as a trafficking victim. Um, and it, it's up to us to talk them through that. Um, also, there may be a fear of deportation, a fear of jail. We, um, in the medical community, we are authority figures, and so they may not understand the system that we are, you know, not immigration um, officers or anything like that. So um, that's something to think about, and that's a barrier to get over. So there's something called the Blue Campaign. This is by the Department of Homeland Security. It's a national public awareness campaign, and this is for the public, for law enforcement, for others to help recognize indicators. And so you can go to their website and get these great cards to hand out. You can give them out in your clinic, you can give them out um, to your family, to your friends, and this is really so that you can start to recognize, see what what issues that a trafficking patient may be, um, like the indicators to see um, and to recognize this. So on these cards, it talks about the difference between human trafficking and human smuggling. So just remember that smuggling is a transportation based while trafficking is exploitation based. Um, and then some of these indicators, um, these are kind of for the lay public. Does that victim have freedom of movements? Can they, are they allowed to socialize and things like that? What I want to talk about are the clinical indicators. So in your clinic, in the emergency room, what are those indicators that you need to perk up your ears about? Um, so 
the patient usually if they do they'll come in with their trafficker they may appear afraid of the adult or overly submissive and anxious they may give false demographic information they may not have an id and that may be a form of control um, they may not be able to describe where they're staying they don't know the city that they're in they might pay cash no health insurance um, and things like that um, our chief complaint is actually a very wide range of issues, um, but do think about things like acute sexual assault, suicide attempts, behavioral issues, um, STD, preg STD or pregnancy testing, um, and things like that. So you have the victim, they're coming into our office, something is off for you. Um, you the one thing that you really need to attempt to try is to separate um, the patient from the person that's with them. Um, so in our clinic at Texas Tech, we interview all teenagers alone. Um, I want to get to know my patient. I want the patient to um, be more aware of their medical care, to know what's going on, um, to establish that rapport. So initially I'll ask the parent, is it okay if I talk with your teenager alone? Um, and kind of go from there. But if I do feel resistance, we may have to be a little bit more sneaky about it. So do we need to have them fill out forms? Do we need to have them get an x-ray or get lab work done? Things like that, um, that I can separate and just make sure that things are stable, that, that everything is going okay. Um, at that point, if you've separated um, and you're talking to your patient, allow that patient to decide if they'd feel more comfortable with the male or female practitioner. Um, if the more comfortable that you make that patient, the more rapport that you build, um, you are doing the patient a better service in that, in that situation. If they require interpretation, this should be a no-brainer, but use a professional interpreter that's unrelated to the patient. Um, and then once you're alone, the first thing you need to talk about is your confidentiality policy. If they are a child or a teenager, um, you do have to talk about your mandatory reporting laws, you know, and saying, you know, I'm here to discuss with you. Um, everything that we talk about will remain confidential unless somebody's hurting you or you're going to hurt somebody else or yourself. So after I get through and I'm talking about um, things with this patient, when I'm looking over the patient, I'm looking for signs of assault, any bruising, any wounds, any scars, um, mutilations, things like that. Um, if the patient's coming for STI testing, pregnancy complications, um, if I'm getting that to that point, I'm not going to push a, a genital exam on them. The best thing is if you do have a suspected sexual assault, the patient is stable, um, and you have a SANE nurse available, they should be utilized. Um, the SANE nurses are extremely well informed on how to take care of these patients. They do it um, with their trauma-informed care background. They um, know exactly the chain of custody for issues like this. So definitely use your SANE nurses if you have them available. Um, I also recently learned that there's something called Telesane. So if that, you can use that um, with a nurse or a physician in the room and they can talk you through the SANE exam. So this is something that definitely should be utilized because um, it can help in the patient's final outcome. So any other chronic medical problems that I need to talk to the patient about. There may be mental disorders, they're going through a traumatic experience, addiction issues, there may be, that may be ways to coerce the patient if they keep them um, high on drugs or um, apply them with alcohol. So any sleep or eating disorders, any untreated chronic illnesses, if this is an adult with untreated cardiovascular disease or things like that, why is that happening? Why is that not getting addressed? Um, any infectious diseases spread in unsanitary environments. So a patient that you wouldn't expect to have hepatitis or tuberculosis, take a second look at that. Um, any reproductive health problems. Um, if a patient is having um, abortions, like multiple abortions, or in, it's a child, why is it happening? Um, uh, also body tattoos. So that may be a mark um, of a pimp or a trafficker. So we do have mandated reporter obligations. So 
any life-threatening danger, this needs to be immediately reported to law enforcement. So if, if you or the patient is in life-threatening danger, um, that is reported immediately. So Texas law requires that any person who believes that a child, a person 65 years or older, or an adult with disabilities, if you believe they're being abused, neglected, or exploited, you have to report those circumstances. Even if you are wrong, if that crosses your mind, that is a reportable thing. Um, and then if they're a minor, there are mandatory state reporting laws require immediate intervention, so no longer than 48 hours. In Texas, you can call abuse and neglect hotline. That number is there. It's easily Googleable. Um, so you can make a report to the local or state law enforcement or DFPS. One thing that we do need to remember is that sometimes in the hospital we send the social worker in and the social worker is kind of taking care of that piece of it for us. Um, it is your job to make sure that that has been followed through. Um, there, I have had a few instances where the social worker and I did not see eye to eye with a patient and I still believe that there was something going on. Um, some abuse happening so i physically made that um, call myself and so this is not just a reporting to your supervisor or manager or upper level or things like that make sure that that is followed through so with this and we think about in texas everybody is considered a mandated reporter but even more if you're a licensed or certified by the state you can lose your license if this is not um, occurring. So teachers, nurses, doctors, daycare employees, employees of a clinic, um, juvenile probation officers, we must report our suspicions within 48 hours of contact. One very difficult thing I think is that if the patient is an independent adult, that they are not over 65, they don't have any disabilities, you have to explain these options to the patient and gain the patient's permission. You must get explicit informed consent um, from the patient. So if they will not allow you to call the authorities, will not allow this report to happen, um, if you can give them the um, National Human Trafficking Hotline number, um, that may be useful to them in the future. Um, I have to remember that I am not an investigator. I am a physician. I can take care of the medical side of things. If I have reported this and I have um, done my duty with that, um, that is the part of my job that I need to do. I, I do not need to make a full investigation. I do not need to um, do a full interview with this. If I have an outcry um, that a patient is being coerced to do something, um, I don't want to go further in that um, when there's people that can take care of that better. Um, we have people like forensic interviewers like our um, child, at our child advocacy centers that can ask those questions in a non-leaning way. Um, so it's a, a better, there's people that are more equipped to do that. So if you get, are getting that um, outcry, you're getting that time, you do need to kind of shut it down. As physicians, we want to know all the details. We want to know every single symptom they're having, you know, every time this happened. And that is just not the way to go in this situation. So that detailed safety planning should be left to the advocates, to social workers, to case managers. Um, and here we can call a, an advocate to come and sit with the patient um, while this is all going on because it is nice to have somebody that's actually there advocating for them um, that's talking them through this too. So our challenges and our opportunities. Um, Challenges for us is that this is a, it's ignites fear. Um, so you do have to think about your own personality and you have to think about how you approach patients. I'm usually a little bit more passive. I don't want confrontation. Um, and I have got to coach myself through that um, because this is gonna be an area of confrontation. Um, if you are more confrontational, if you are usually a little bit more aggressive, it may be something that you have to dial back so you, that you keep the patient safe. So, but there is that fear in us, and I hope that in, with doing the simulations um, beforehand that that can kind of take away some of that fear um, when you're addressing the, these type of situations. 
Um, everyone obviously has a time crunch in clinic. You know, I've got 10 to 15 patients in the morning. I need to get through, um, through this to, you know, make it to lunch and make it to the afternoon and go home and hang out with my kiddos. Um, and these patients take a long time. Like if this situation is going to happen, it may be hours in the office that you're doing things for this patient. The thing that we have to remember is that if I am recognizing this and if I am making um, that report, I may be changing this person's life forever. So in my job, it, the most important thing I do this week is make that report, I've done my duty. Um, so I do have to remember that even though things may get pushed to the side, this is important. Um, this could change a life and more than, you know, may see in that next snotty nose. Um, so this is something to really spend time with. Um, there's always that threat of violence, difficulty identifying victims and their, the patient's fear. Um, our opportunities is that policymakers are really starting to open their eyes to this. Um, we are doing this education in our medical system, so there's more resources than ever. Um, and that you can really take that to heart and recognize and respond to trafficking victims. So we talked a little bit, the healthcare field might be the only place where these victims are seen and we can be that first contact. So help recognize those indicators, know those initial action steps. So I'm gonna see my indicators. I'm going to get a feel for the patient. I'm gonna try to se separate them from the um, trafficker and um, separate the trafficker and survivor. Um, I'm going to talk and try to build rapport with that survivor. Um, and then I'm going to try to get them the help they need, um, whether they want to make a report or not, if they're an adult. So your clinical goal should not be to get that disclosure. Um, as I talked about, we're not investigators, but our main goal should be to build that rapport and trust that allows that to come out. Um, it really empowers disclosure if you are um, having that rapport with a patient. So these are our local resources. The bridge is um, Amarillo's Child Advocacy, Advocacy Center, um, and they do an excellent job um, with patients like this. Family Support Services has a section, Freedom in the 806, um, and they also have crisis, service that, crisis services that may help provide assistance to victims. No Boundaries is a wonderful nonprofit organization that is dedicated to helping the victims of sex trafficking. And then there's Texas Resources. Um, the Office of the Attorney General has some great videos online that you can look at um, for that. National Resources, the Polaris Project. Um, this um, publication, Caring for Traffic Persons, is a um, very in-depth, very thorough, um, if you're interested in reading, and it's for healthcare providers. This is the National Human Trafficking Hotline number. This is an easy number to find online. Um, so and if you're giving this to a patient, you can have them memorize that. You could have, you know, write that with some a different name above it or the clinic number or something like that. So they can text, they can email, they can call. Um, but remember, if it's a child, it's a mandatory reporting if it's crossing your mind. Okay, so what we're going to do next is um, go over the video of a simulation of a traffic a trafficking encounter. Um, this was is not exactly what we do for our simulation. Um, these the people in this are our residents and physicians um, that work with me, and I'm so very thankful that they did this for me. Um, but I just wanted to, you to see the simulation um, to kind of get a feel of what that would look like, what that would feel like, how the doctor responds to the victim. Um, so I hope you enjoy um, this video. Hey, Dr. Tajani, can Hi. I talk to you before you go see this patient yes, real quick? Okay. I I don't know how to describe it, but I got this weird vibe, okay? okay? She's here with her older brother, but he just seemed, I don't know, well, he made a scene in the waiting room. Hmm. He didn't want her to come back for the vitals by herself. She doesn't have an ID with her. The whole thing just seemed unusual, okay. and her vital signs are normal, but she seems really uncomfortable. Okay. I just, I wanted you to know how I felt before you saw her. Thank you for letting me know. I'll keep an eye out on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, Rachel. I'm Dr. Tijani. How are you? 
Nice to meet you. Who do you have with you today? Uh, I'm her brother. Okay. Um, so I hear you, you're here for abdominal pain. Can you tell me about it? Um, it's, it's been going on for a while. I don't know why like, it had to be an issue today. Uh, but. Okay, Rachel, can you tell me how long um, this has been going on for? Um, maybe the past couple months. I don't know. Okay, about a couple months. Okay, can you point with one finger exactly where it hurts? Mm -hmm. I'm down there, okay. Um, describe the pain for me in your own words. Um, like kind of sharp. Okay. Yeah. Does the pain move anywhere? I don't so. so tell me, um, what makes this pain better? I mean, I give her like uh, Motrin and stuff. I mean, like. It I think it works. It just, I don't, like, I don't know why we're here today. I mean, like, I'm paying out of pocket for this, and it's just, has, I don't think it's changed. It's just the same thing. I understand. Um, Rachel, does the, does the Motrin help, or does anything help? I think it does help. Okay. Anything in particular makes it really painful? I don't think so. Okay. Um, can you tell me uh, when last you had your period? I mean, that's kind of a personal question here for the abdominal pain. I mean, okay. I'm not saying how that's related. I understand. I understand. Okay. Well, at this point, I think um, it will help me to get an x-ray of your abdomen so I figure out what's going on, okay? Um, we're going to have to do that in a different room, okay? And, sir, because of radiation exposure, we'll have you wait here while she gets this done. Okay. Do you know how much the x-ray is going to cost? Um, it's out of pocket. It, sh it shouldn't cost too much, and we have discounts that we could give you. Alright. Okay. Alright, I'm gonna get my nurse, and then we'll go get this x-ray done. Okay? Thank you so much. Rachel, so, um, based on what um, you've told me so far, and your physical examination, I've, I'm a little bit concerned, okay? Um, before I go into the details, I just wanted to reiterate our confidentiality um, policy, okay? So whatever you disclose to me is confidential, and I would not tell anybody um, without your permission, only if I feel like you're a danger to yourself or somebody else, okay? Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about um, where you stay? Um, what do you want to know? I know you're here with your brother today. Um, do you trust your brother? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you feel safe at home? Yeah. Okay. I'm sensing a little bit of hesitancy, okay? Um, I just want you to know that this is a safe place for you. Um, no one's going to hurt you here. Um, I just would like you to tell me a little bit more about your home situation, okay? Well, he's not really my brother. So who is he? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Alright, I'm going to ask you a bit of a personal question, okay? Um, Tell me if are you being asked to do anything against your will? Yeah. Can you tell me the, what those things are? Well, they make me and the other girls have sex with different men. Um, and we don't have a choice. Rachel, I'm so sorry to hear this, but this is important for me to know, okay? Um, Based on what you just told me, I am obligated to report this to the authorities, but I do want to give you that option. Um, is this something you would like to report? Can you do it for me? I'm really scared. Definitely, definitely. I am glad to report this to the police for you, but I want to give you that option also, if you want to do it. Yeah, I think you should do it. I okay, definitely. I would like to do that, okay? Thank you so much for being brave today. That's You're being brave for really sharing that with me, okay? Um, there's another p part that I do, do want to get your consent on. Um, based on this history of um, sexual activity, um, we do have to do uh, something called a SANE exam, okay? Um, and it's an exam that's done by a trained um, healthcare professional, and it's an exam of the genital region, just so we know how to better help you, especially with your complaint of abdominal pain. Um, are you okay if we do that exam today? Yeah. And you? Okay, good. All right, I'm going to um, go call the authorities. I would like you to wait here. How are you feeling right now? I'm scared. Okay, I understand. All right, we'll try and get everything taken care of, okay? okay. Sir, 
Sir, I need you to stand up and come with me, please. What's this about? I'll tell you once we exit the building. Okay, so um, I thank my residents and my attending physicians um, for helping me with that video. Um, and one thing that I did want to say is that we would love to expand this project. So if you are in charge of a clinic, of um, nursing students, of you know any office staff, um, we could adapt our simulation to do that. Um, and we could put your um, staff or your students through these simulations um, and ha have them learn from this way. So it's a really, really neat thing to get to go through um, and to kind of decide how you would respond if you were in that situation. And so if anybody is interested in this, um, we will give you that information that you can contact us and we can kind of work with you to decide how to go about that. Um, I think this is a really exciting time um, and that I'm really thankful to be involved in this. Here are my references. And thank you. What great information, Dr. Anderson. I would assume that we're going to see some innovative and beneficial practices in the future because of your efforts here with us today. Next now, Dr. Amy Stark is board certified in both general and addiction psychiatry. Upon earning her medical degree from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, Dr. Stark completed residency in general psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Following residency, Dr. Stark completed fellowship training in addiction psychiatry at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Dr. Stark's areas of expertise and professional interests include opioid use disorder and medication-assisted treatment, alcohol use disorder, stimulant use disorder, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and psychiatry for specialty populations, including peripartum women and the LGBTQ community. She is certified to provide transcranial magnetic stimulation as a treatment option for those with treatment-resistant depression. She's currently an associate professor of psychiatry at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Amarillo. Dr. Stark. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Amy Stark. I am an associate professor of psychiatry at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Amarillo. And I'm here today to talk to you about trauma-informed care. Just a brief introduction. Before we get started, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. By the end of our talk today, I want you to be able to identify different sources of trauma, including human trafficking, identify psychiatric sequelae and the impact on mental health caused by trauma, appreciate the impact that trauma has on quality of life, autonomy and independence, develop an understanding of the foundations of trauma-informed care, recognize the impact of trauma-informed care on the physician-patient or provider-patient relationship, and recognize the importance of survivor-centered, multidisciplinary referrals within the healthcare organization and with community partners. So before we can really understand trauma-informed care, we have to understand trauma. Um, there are several definitions. There's lots of them out there. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM-5, states that for trauma to happen, What's required is actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. Other stressful events that do not have an immediate threat to life or physical injury are not considered trauma by this definition. Good old Merriam-Webster offers up a few more definitions for us. One, an injury such as a wound to a living tissue caused by an extrinsic agent. Two, a disordered psychic or behavioral state resulting from severe mental or emotional stress or physical injury, and three, an emotional upset. However, for our purposes today, SAMHSA, or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, offers up the most useful definition, stating that trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances 
that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. This definition includes several really important points. One, that trauma can be ongoing, and two, there's an impact, a negative impact on functioning. Trauma experts agree that we should be conceptualizing trauma as a dynamic process. It's not just the traumatic event itself, it's ongoing. You must consider the interaction between an event or series of events and the individual level of vulnerability and resilience or protective factors. Speaking broadly, there are many kinds of trauma and trauma can occur at any point across the lifespan. Common causes can be split into natural disasters like hurricanes or wildfires and traumas caused by people. Of those that are caused by people, there are accidents like car crashes and there are intentional traumas like physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. It's important to recognize that many kinds of trauma can be hidden and most survivors have a history of several different kinds of trauma. Speaking more specifically, most survivors of human trafficking have experienced other kinds of non-trafficked abuses, often concurrently. It's also important to recognize historical trauma. There are political, economic, and structural determinants of health and disease, such as unjust power dynamics and social inequality that play a critical role in creating and perpetuating poor health for populations. Understanding the potential for historical trauma in populations is essential not only for clinicians, but for systems of care if they are striving to provide trauma-informed services. We know that the mental health consequences of trauma victims are serious, and we also know that trauma changes our bodies on a cellular level. Survivors who develop post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, have been shown to have tonically elevated central nervous system concentrations of norepinephrine and an exaggerated response to norepinephrine activation. And when you compare depressed patients with and without trauma histories, those who are survivors have been shown to have lower serotonin binding potential in multiple brain regions. We know that those disturbances in serotonin and norepinephrine are implicated in depressive and anxiety disorders. Survivors of trafficking are at a higher risk of developing psychiatric symptoms and disorders as a direct consequence of the constant fear, psychological manipulation, and physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that they experience. The most commonly reported problems are depression, anxiety, nightmares, flashbacks, low self-esteem, and feelings of guilt and shame. Survivors of trafficking also have an increased rate of attempted suicide and diagnoses, of course, of post-traumatic stress disorder. Maladaptive substance use is also higher in this population. Trafficked people are often forced to use drugs or alcohol by their abusers, or they turn to substances as a means to cope with their experiences. Unfortunately, these effects can be long-term and, and can pose serious challenges for survivors attempting to reintegrate into society, leaving them susceptible for re-victimization later. As I mentioned earlier, trauma is a dynamic process. We must consider the interactions between an event and a person's risk and protective factors. We must consider that there are factors that are protective and those that predispose us to developing illnesses at the level of the individual, interpersonal relationships, community, and society. Individual factors are things like age, state of physical health, mental health and cognition, temperament, education, gender, coping styles, and socioeconomic standing. Interpersonal factors include our support systems or lack thereof, like family, peers, 
significant others. This also includes our family medical history, including psychiatric, history of trauma, and our social networks. Factors at the community level are things like quality and safety of the neighborhood, school system, and work environments, access to healthcare settings, access to faith systems, transportation availability, and community socioeconomic standings. Societal factors include things like our laws and policies, societal norms, judicial systems, and of course the influence of the media. Other cultural factors to consider include ethnicity, cultural norms, and subsystems. Any of those factors that I just mentioned, depending on how they present, can either be a protective factor or a risk factor for development of disease following a trauma like human trafficking. It's important to note that a prior history of childhood trauma is a significant risk factor for development of mental illness, physical illness, and premature mortality in adulthood. Childhood trauma and adversity are also at the root of many high-risk adult behaviors and diseases. Even survivors who don't go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental illnesses are affected by their experiences. Trafficking survivors characteristically describe feelings of intense stigma, shame, anxiety, and hopelessness that significantly impairs their daily functioning. The analogy of a rock hitting the water's surface is often used to describe trauma. The impact first creates the largest wave which is followed by ever-expanding but less intense ripples. The effects of the cumulative trauma experienced by trafficking survivors extend far beyond the time under their traffickers' control by disrupting coping mechanisms, undermining self-confidence, and inhibiting the ability to form healthy and trusting relationships with others. Trauma-informed care is not specifically designed to treat symptoms or syndromes related to trauma, but rather to provide systems of care that are informed about and sensitive to trauma-related issues present in survivors. Trauma-informed care is not just a fixed set of interventions. Rather, it's a journey. The goal is to develop a strengths-based service delivery approach that's grounded in an understanding and responsiveness to the impact of trauma that emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety for both survivors and providers to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. It should be noted that social justice and health equity are fundamentally necessary to create the conditions in which all people can heal from past traumatic experiences. So continuing to strive for those ideals is a foundation of trauma-informed care. SAMHSA's four R's, or realize, recognize, respond, and resist, can serve as a guideline of the pillars of trauma-informed care, but there are many important complexities to these four facets. We're gonna highlight some of those complexities today. Based on their experiences, survivors may be scared to enter into healthcare systems. Many common aspects of the medical system can be daunting and even risk re-traumatization. Many, many trafficked persons have difficulty building trusting relationships and establishing rapport with authority figures. Cultivating an environment that validates the experience can increase the sense of safety and hope. Be mindful that building trust takes time, but using a trauma-informed approach may help you bridge that gap. Trauma-informed care begins with the very first person a survivor may have contact with in a system of care. This means that all staff members, from receptionist to physicians to peer specialists to board members and CEOs, should be trained to recognize the signs that a person may be being trafficked. Trauma-informed care requires all staff members to recognize that the individual's experience of trauma can greatly influence his or her receptivity to and engagement with services, the interactions with staff and clients, and responsiveness to program guidelines, practices, and interventions. 
Trauma-informed care includes program policies, procedures, and practices to protect the vulnerabilities of those who have experienced trauma and those who provide trauma-related services. Work to identify behaviors that outside of the context of trauma may have been seen as pathological, but rather look at those behaviors as adaptations that helped this person survive. This can limit guilt and shame and also helps to build trust between the patient and provider. Recognize and help the patient see that what may have previously been seen as problematic behaviors or personality traits are a direct consequence of their trauma. As a trauma-informed provider, it's important that you help clients bridge the gap between their mental health and substance-related issues and their traumatic pasts. All too often, trauma occurs before substance use and mental disorders develop. Then, the development of such disorders and their associated symptoms and consequences create opportunities for additional traumatic events to occur. Understand that trafficked people may have limited social supports and resources because of the isolation of their trauma. Work to connect them with community supports and resources that will aid in recovery and reintegration. Strive to ensure that the setting is as safe as possible, both physically and emotionally, and that patients feel safe with employees and providers to discuss these sensitive topics. In addition to making our patients feel safe, and increasing community supports to allow for recovery, it's important to recognize that survivors also have the same needs for comprehensive health care as compared to non-exploited individuals. However, couching their care in terms of their previous experiences is very important. Validating their experience increases a sense of safety and will allow patients to feel more comfortable in addressing their other medical needs. The best approaches are to integrate services, addressing medical and psychological needs at the same time as the trauma is being addressed. Integrated care means that consideration of past traumas, like trafficking, is considered when providing all other services. Strive to have the ability to make referrals to other services both within and separate from the medical field that will provide trauma-informed care. Trafficking survivors, like all patients, will need access to primary care, mental health services, cancer screening, ongoing violence and abuse screening, substance use screening and treatment, anticipatory, excuse me, anticipatory guidance regarding growth and development, life skills, healthy social relationships and parenting, access to immunizations, reproductive care, and dental care. All of these services should be delivered in a trauma-informed, non-judgmental and culturally competent manner. In addition to medical services, having knowledge of social and community supports and the ability to connect survivors is key in the process of recovery. Public sector service systems are a necessary component to recovering from trauma and being able to successfully reintegrate following trafficking. Some of the systems include our educational institutions, housing authorities, faith-based organizations, and government bodies like the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Systemic barriers to accessing these supports must be removed. Once survivors have accessed care, it's essential that we minimize the possibility of re-traumatization. Best practices are to treat all patients as if they might be survivors. We know that trauma exposure is exceedingly common, with estimates of lifetime trauma exposure in the United States ranging from 50 to 89%. Treating all patients as survivors normalizes assessing for a trauma history and helps to develop and rely on processes or procedures that are most likely to be growth promoting and least likely to be re-traumatizing. Empower our survivors, highlight their strengths and emphasize the valuable roles that they're already playing in society. 
build on the individual's existing resources and view them as a resourceful, resilient survivor. Be mindful of language and labels. You may have noticed that I haven't once used the word victim. Defining a person entirely as a victim can become a problematic identity. Survivor counteracts that sense of powerless that the term victim implies. Ensure safety. Survivors must feel respected, safe, and accepted. Components that help with this are clear and open communication, addressing roles and boundaries early, and being mindful of language concordance. If a patient doesn't speak English, ensure that they have access to a professional translator. Don't use friends or family. This ensures that the patient is heard and understood while respecting their privacy and autonomy. Always work to ensure that the provider-patient relationship is collaborative, regardless of setting or service. But go one step further than that. Assist with building collaborative relationships beyond your provider-patient relationship. Building ongoing relationships across the service system, provider networks, and the local community enhances trauma-informed care continuity. This is really important. Recovery cannot occur in isolation. Healthy relationships are a necessary component. Engage survivors in development of your services. This empowers them. It allows them to utilize their voice and strengths and ensures that your services have representation from the target population. Another key component to reducing the risk of re-traumatization is practicing cultural humility. That doesn't mean that you need detailed knowledge of every culture, but rather that you recognize the importance of cultural context. Being a trauma-informed provider means that you're committing to lifelong learning about your own identity so that we can better understand our own complex cultural identities and the aspects of power and privilege or lack thereof in society. Then we use that self-awareness and respect for others' self-determined and always evolving cultural identity to interact in ways that recognize, minimize, and mitigate power differentials. It's okay to ask questions about your patient's culture. It's a really good thing to ask questions. Be open to being educated and work to see their experiences through the lens of their cultural background. Using a trauma-informed approach will help you connect with your patients and begin on their own road to recovery. Thank you so much for being here at this very important symposium today. Um, I hope that you're all able to take something away from this and start integrating these important practices into your own place of work and with your own patients. Here's my references. Again, thank you for your time. Dr. Lori Rice Spearman is the ninth president of Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center and the first female president in the Texas Tech University system. She is a fierce advocate for human sex trafficking education and a true supporter of the Lord W. Bush Institute. Thank you for joining this important conversation today. I'm truly appreciative of the Laura W. Bush Institute for Women's Health and their bold leadership in presenting this challenging but critical and timely topic. Human trafficking can easily be hidden, and it has been, until now. Certainly, there are hot spots in larger metropolitan areas where trafficking may be more prevalent, but we do know the interstate corridors of I-10, I-20, and I-40 are providing convenient routes across the state, which brings trafficking directly through four of our campus communities, Amarillo, Midland, Odessa, and Abilene. In order to affect change, we must be willing to bring the topic to the forefront of our conversations as trafficking impacts social, emotional, mental, and physical health. I'm proud of our efforts led by our university leadership and alumni who are joining together through the Human Trafficking Collaborative to address prevention, education, research, and survivor services. I'm also grateful to our state leaders who have introduced legislation to combat trafficking. This is an issue that will require us all to think innovatively and work collaboratively. 
Thank you for your interest and for joining in this very important effort. And now to close things, we welcome back Dr. Richard Jordan. Wow, what great and informative presentations. I believe our symposium on human sex trafficking is a resounding success. And we have so many to thank. Office of TTUHSC President, Dr. Lori Rice Spearman, the Laura W. Bush Institute for Women's Health in Amarillo and in Abilene, and its Senior Director, Ms. Angela Knapp, without whom we could have never done this symposium. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to Amarillo College. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, Dr. Jordan Greenbaum, Dr. Teresa Baker, Dr. Rachel Anderson, Dr. Amy Stark, Mr. Ariel Rodriguez, Ms. Lisa Bounds, Ms. Tracy Rogers, and of course our outstanding steering committee. And now for one of the most important announcements from our symposium. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center and the Laura W. Bush Institute for Women's Health is very proud to announce that with the proceeds raised from the annual Power of the Purse luncheon, we are providing a substantial donation to one of the crown jewels of the Texas Panhandle, the bridge. Shelley Bohannon, is the executive director of the bridge. And for those that don't know, the bridge is a comprehensive institution that prevents child abuse and greatly assists in child abuse investigations. And we are also providing substantial donation for Tracy Rogers and her wonderful group at No Boundaries International of Amarillo for everything they do to help our local sex trafficking victims. Thank you for joining us. And for those interested in hearing more from our truly remarkable speakers, 